Well, I hope you've been enjoying our church service so far. Uh, hasn't it just been awesome? And uh, thank you so much, uh, Logan and Shanique, for sharing your story. And uh, what amazing miracles the Lord has blessed uh, the men family with, with Zuri and Zaria. And uh, what, what precious gifts uh, from God. And we're excited to see uh, your family being raised up and growing uh, together in the Lord. Uh, also, it's just great to hear all the hearts that shared for missions contribution. And uh, I think, in a way, their hearts uh, really convey an overarching heart that I believe our church has. You know, as a church, we, we've already given 88% of our $50,000 missions contribution goal. We've given over $44,000. And we still have an entire month left to go. I think that God is going to more than just blow out our goal and really provide the money that we need here in Toronto to be able to do more and more for the Lord and to advance the gospel throughout our great city. Well, you know, the, the theme of our year here in 2021 is the year of mountain moving faith. And that theme comes from a scripture in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, where Jesus says, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. I mean, what an incredible scripture. What an amazing promise from Jesus. And what an awesome theme that we get to have this year, the year of mountain moving faith. You know, excitingly, the word mountain in the Old Testament it's often symbolic of the word kingdom. In fact, uh, we're going to read in just a little bit how, how God gave uh, a king a prophecy about a mountain, but what really was about God's kingdom. And so we know that, that Jesus, when he's saying this, he's using a little bit of uh, symbolism here that, that through our faith, we can move mountains, and through our faith, we can move God's kingdom, God's church, even here in our great city of Toronto. Amen. Well, I, I was thinking about this, this theme for our year, and I decided to entitle the lesson here this morning, A Mountain That Fills the Earth. Turn your Bible with me to Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. A mountain that fills the earth. You know, we find right here that God's people are, are in captivity in Babylon, and the timing is around 550 B.C. Of course, we know that Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon, and Babylon itself was known to be a gorgeous, beautiful city. In fact, uh, the hanging gardens uh, were built by Nebuchadnezzar in around 600 B.C. And if you're not sure what the hanging gardens are, they're, they're considered, even in modern times, as one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And, and literally what he did is he put these gardens up on these terraces that were around 75 feet high. And so it's just this huge... Uh, amazing display uh, of gardening, and uh, I don't know even what you call it, but it was incredible, spectacular, and the city itself was just decorated like that. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. But, but sadly, Babylon was also known to be a very worldly city. Uh, in fact, the word Babylon uh, eventually became synonymous with just wickedness in general, and that's why in the book of Revelation, the word Babylon can be found six times in reference to the Roman Empire, that God was going to eventually cr uh, crush and, and, and uh, just totally dismantle because of their wickedness and because of their persecution against God's people. And yet, it's in Babylon, in this gorgeous city, in, in this also worldly city, that we find some of the Bible's most faithful men. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, in chapter 2 of Daniel, in verse 1, you don't have to turn there, but we find that in the second year of, of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, uh, God gives Nebuchadnezzar a dream. And the Bible says that his mind was troubled and he could not sleep. You ever have a dream like that where you're just so disturbed, you're, you're troubled, you can't sleep? Uh, you know, even last night my wife had a nightmare that she was being stalked and she couldn't find me to help protect her. I, I mean, sometimes we have those type of dreams. Different, though, than some of our dreams God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream for an exciting purpose. And so Nebuchadnezzar, being so disturbed by this dream, pulled together all of his advisors, his magicians, his enchanters, his astrologers, his sorcerers, and he goes, okay, guys, I want you to tell me what this dream means. 
And if you don't, I'm going to turn uh, your houses into rubble and I'm going to cut you into pieces. Well, his advisors respond back, okay, king, well, well, just tell us the dream and we'll interpret it for you. But then Nebuchadnezzar, being a wise king, says, well, if you tell, if I tell you the dream, you're just going to make something up and I won't be able to trust the interpretation. So I want you to tell me what I dreamed and then interpret it for me. And once again, if you don't, I'm going to cut you into pieces and I'm going to turn your houses into piles of rubble. Well, in chapter 2 and verse 11, in response to the king, his advisors say, What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. You know, they, 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 they are in some ways right that it was going to take a god to reveal the dream to them for them to be able to interpret it to the king. However, they were wrong that God does not live among men. You see, their gods did not live among men, but Daniel's God lived among men. And so we find that God gives Daniel the meaning of the, the vision and the vision itself. And so in chapter 2 and verse 31, Daniel's going to tell the king what his dream was. Go with me to Daniel 2 verse 31. Let's read together. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. You know, our first point this morning is dazzling statue or a humble rock. Dazzling statue or a humble rock. You know, right here we find that God gives Nebuchadnezzar this, this vision, this dream of enormous statue. The Bible records that it was made up of different metals. Its head was made from pure gold. Its chest and arms were made from silver. Its belly and thighs of bronze and its legs and feet were a mixture of iron and baked clay. And the Bible says while Nebuchadnezzar was watching, I mean, he was just so awestruck by this statue. After all, it was awesome in appearance and it was dazzling. The Bible says while he was watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. Well, the question has to come. If this was a rock that was cut out, but it was not cut out by human hands, whose hands cut out this rock? And that's the point. God's hands cut this rock out. This was a rock sent to earth from God in heaven. And yet we find right here in the story that the rock comes down and hits the statue on its feet. And all of the metals of the statue, the sections of the statue, begin to crumble. The gold, the silver, the bronze, and the iron and clay, they all fall to pieces. And the Bible says they become like chaff on the threshing floor, and the wind sweeps them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue stays in place and grows to become a mountain that eventually fills the entire earth. Well, I think we also understand that these different metals were symbolic of different world empires, world kingdoms, during Nebuchadnezzar's time and immediately after Nebuchadnezzar's time. In other words, the head of gold represented Babylon. It represented the Babylonian Empire. You, you can find that out just by reading on in verse 36 to 38. Daniel says, hey, you are that head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. The, the gold is Babylon. But then we've got the chest and arms of silver, which we know represents historically the Medo-Persian Empire. And, and in fact, this begins to happen just a few chapters after this, uh, as the Medes start to take over, then eventually the Persian and the Medes take over the Babylonian Empire. Uh, in fact, a lot of people don't know this, but Darius, the guy who threw Daniel into the lion's den, was a Mede. And Cyrus, who uh, let Israel go back into Jerusalem to build the temple, was Persian. So the Medo-Persians come together and, and take over Babylon. That happens within the book of Daniel. Then you've got the belly and thighs of bronze. Well, who does that represent? The Greek Empire, led by none other than Alexander the Great. And I love what the scripture says in verse 39. It says, this kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. 
And that was the entire goal of Alexander the Great. He wanted to conquer the, the entire known world. Well, finally, we have the legs and the feet of iron mixed with clay. What empire does that symbolize? The Roman Empire. And so what's the point of this dream? What, what's the point of this prophecy to Nebuchadnezzar, to God's people through Nebuchadnezzar? That God was going to send a rock from heaven. He was going to send Jesus from heaven during the time of the Roman Empire because that's when the rock struck the statue on its feet, representing the Roman Empire. And, and God's kingdom that Jesus would establish on earth would eventually grow to become a mountain that fills the entire earth. And so how awesome it is to be a part of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that will endure forever. Amen, church? But you know, one of the things that, that stands out to me in the scripture is that the Bible describes the world, the kingdoms of the world, as an enormous statue, a dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. But at the same time, it describes the kingdom of God before it becomes a mountain that fills the entire earth as just a simple, humble rock. And so we've got to ask ourselves this morning, dazzling statue, the world, or humble rock, the kingdom of God? You know, I think that in many ways, Satan can dazzle us with the world. He can put things in front of us like sex, money, power, fame. And we think that these things are going to be so fulfilling, so awesome. And sometimes he even tries to lure us out of the kingdom of God for these things. Because we're just so attracted to these things like a fly buzzing around those little blue lights that eventually get stung by those electrical things. We're so dazzled. We're so in awe sometimes of the world. And yet we can look at the kingdom and go, oh, we're just a humble little group of 45 people here in Toronto. Just a humble little rock. And sometimes when we look at the world compared to the rock, we can be so dazzled by the world and at the same time unimpressed by the kingdom of God. You know, I was watching a documentary recently that was suggested to me by Shanique on Netflix. And it was apparently about a guy that's rather famous here in Canada named Luca Magnata. And I didn't know this story, but it's a very sad story. I mean, the guy had a, a twisted mind and very sick, and, and he started off just torturing cats and, and putting videos about him torturing cats online. Well, eventually that escalated, and he eventually killed a person, made a video about it, and put that online, and even dismembered him and sent his body parts to various political agencies throughout Canada. Well, you might ask, well, why did he do these things? According to the documentary, it was one simple thing. He, he wanted so badly to be famous. And he was willing to do whatever it took, even to do something that would hurt other per people or hurt animals, just so that he could get attention, just so that he could become famous. He was obsessed with his vanity, and he was dazzled by the world. You know, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, his creation, so that people are without excuse. But then the Bible goes on in verse 25 and says, They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things, rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. What, what's the Bible saying right here? He's saying that God created the world. In such a way as to display his greatness, as to display his power, but, but ultimately to display his existence to us. I mean, every primitive tribe that has ever been discovered on earth has some sort of belief in a higher power. I mean, who told them that there's this concept of a higher power out there? It's natural because they look around at creation. They look around at what God has made. And they go, well, there, there must be an intelligent designer behind these things. There must be a creator. And so everybody looks at creation and can understand from creation itself that there is something behind it. There is a God. And that was purposed by God. But, but sadly, too often, we look at creation, we look at the world around us, and rather than it steering us to God, we fall in love with the creation rather than the creator. And that's what the Bible's saying right here. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator. I want to ask you this morning, have you been dazzled by the world? 
Have you been looking out to otherworldly people's lives and desiring what they have, a bigger house, a bigger salary, more money to spend, a nicer car? Or have you just been all about the kingdom of God? You see, so often, Satan wants to distract us. He wants us to look to the world. He wants our attention to be focused on what other people have, things that are temporary, things that ultimately have an expiration date. Well, let's see what Nebuchadnezzar does in response to this dream that God has given him. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, and treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, that all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. You know, I think that from this passage, it's quite clear uh, exactly what Nebuchadnezzar felt about God's vision, God's dream for his life. Daniel goes, say, Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. The head of gold will represent the Babylonian Empire. What does Nebuchadnezzar do? He builds an entire statue of gold. He goes, say, I don't want to just be the head. I want to be the whole thing. You see, he didn't want to have anything to do with the humble rock. He didn't want to have anything to do with the, the kingdom of God. He wanted it to be the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. He wanted it to be all about himself. And so he builds a statue of himself. 27 meters high, 90 feet high, higher than even the famous hanging gardens, that ancient wonder of the world that existed there in Babylon. He wanted everyone in Babylon to see him. And more importantly than that, he wanted everyone in Babylon to worship him. He was dazzled by the world, and he wanted the world to be dazzled by him. You know, I'm so inspired uh, by our young people here in the church who have really invested themselves into our mission's contribution. I mean, it's incredible that we're at 88% of our goal, $50,000, almost a month out from our mission's contribution. I mean, typically speaking, the day of our mission's contribution, we collect about 20 to 25% of our goal. And already we're at 88%. You know, I've secretly been praying that, that God would blow it out and give us $60,000. Wouldn't that be awesome? But, but it's so incredible to see all these young people who've come into the church, in particular even our, our newest Christians, which we don't usually expect to give contribution because they come into the kingdom and then they're just hit with it right away. And, and in spite of all that, they've been so sacrificial, so giving, and it's amazing to see because so many people their age in the world are all about getting a house all about investing themselves in the world, all about their future, their career. And, and yet we have people in the kingdom of God that are all about the kingdom of God. Amen? You know, when God shows you his dream, his plan for your life, there are really only two responses that we can have. We can be like Nebuchadnezzar and be all about building up our own life and rejecting the kingdom of God. Or we can accept God's vision of the kingdom of God and reject building up our own life. And right here we find that Nebuchadnezzar was all about himself. But we've got to be all about the kingdom of God. Go to Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. We're going to see an analogy, a parable of Jesus that I think connects to this idea of a humble rock versus a dazzling statue. Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house and it could not shake 
because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment that torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. You know, here we find a very famous parable, the parable of the wise and foolish builder. And of course, one of the guys in the story built his house, his life on the rock, while the other one in the story built his life, his, his house on sand. And of course, we, we know that the storm, as it rises up, takes out the guy's house who was built on sand. You know, I think one of the things that people think in this story is that one of these guys heard the word of God, the one who built it on a rock, and the other guy who built on sand didn't hear the word of God. But, but in fact, both of these men heard the word of God. The issue is that only one of them put it into practice. Bottom line is that there are a lot of Nebuchadnezzars who hear the dream, who hear the word of God, and yet choose to build their life on things other than the word of God, choose to build a statue to themselves. You with me right here? And that statue, like their life, will always crumble in comparison to the kingdom of God. You know, I love this story, and it makes me wonder why, why Jesus thought of this. You know, we know that Jesus was a carpenter. And maybe this was something that happened to him as a carpenter before he started his ministry. Maybe he was approached by someone that says, hey, Jesus, we want to hire you to build us a house. And so Jesus goes, well, tell me where you want it to be. And he goes out and surveys the area where he wants to build a house. And the guy finds this beautiful beach. And he goes, I want to build my house right here next to the water on this beautiful beach with this view on the sand. It's going to be amazing. And Jesus goes, hey, I don't think that's such a good idea. Uh, I mean, you don't want to build on sand. It's a shaky foundation. I mean, there's erosion that happens uh, through the water. Uh, an earthquake could come and shake the house loose. I, I think it'd be much wiser for you to build your house inland on rocks so that it's a stable house, a stable foundation. The guy goes, no, no, no. I think it's going to be fine. Jesus, I want you to build my house. Jesus goes, that's not, that's not smart. That's not wise. And the guy goes, I'll pay you double. And so Jesus eventually allows the guy to have him build a house there on, on sand. And so he builds the guy's house on sand. And sure enough, over time, a storm hits. Waters and the waves come higher. And they start crashing against his house. And before you know it, the guy comes back in and goes, Oh, Jesus, you are right. I should have listened. I should have built my house on rock. I think so many people are going to be like that when it comes to judgment time. So many people are going to wish they would have listened to Jesus. So many people are going to wish they would have listened to the dream. Listen to the word of God because their house has not stood because it was not built on rock. You know, I, I love uh, uh, that, that today we're going to see Matt Ladla get baptized. Amen. And uh, Matt's such an incredible guy. He's such a, a smart guy. I, I, I'll never forget when I first met him, I, I thought he was a biker. I said, hey, did you ride a bike here, right? like a, a, a motorbike? Because uh, I think he had a nice leather jacket on or something to that effect. And uh, I was surprised to find out that he's not a biker, but instead he was a guy that, that was like an astrophysicist or something like that that builds satellite parts and sends them into space. I'm like, man, this guy's a genius. And it's so amazing to see uh, him go through the Bible studies, and you can see how it's just changed even his personality. And today when he makes Jesus the Lord of his life, when he gets baptized and comes up out of the waters of baptism, he has decided to build his house on rock. And different than almost anybody else I've studied the Bible with, I've never seen someone go so deep into the Bible. I mean, just Lane challenged Matt to read the scriptures, and Matt read so much of the New Testament. He read it faster than I think anybody I've ever seen before. And he is truly, like the scripture says, someone who dug down deep. And I'm so excited for Matt to get baptized, to build his house, because his house from here on forth is not going to be built on worldly things. He's no longer dazzled by the world. But it's going to be built on something stable that doesn't have an expiration date. It's going to be built on a humble rock, but a rock, a mountain that will eventually fill the entire earth. Amen, church? Let's go to our second point. Our first point, a dazzling statue or a humble rock? Our second point, play it safe or have a fiery faith. Play it safe or have a fiery faith. Well, we know that Nebuchadnezzar builds a statue right here to honor himself. And then he calls together all his satraps, his prefects, his governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officers 
for the dedication of the statue to himself. But, but then he has a herald announce to everyone that they've got to bow down and worship the statue uh, whenever they hear the music. Otherwise, they'll be thrown into the blazing furnace. Let's pick up our story in Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever! Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. You know, right here we find that the music begins to play in Babylon. And as ordered by Nebuchadnezzar, all the people within the country start bowing down to this 90-foot high statue that, that Nebuchadnezzar had built for himself. Well, as the music is playing and as people are bowing down, some of the, 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 the people there notice that there are these three Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, who weren't bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And so they, they turn to, to tattletales and they go and run to Nebuchadnezzar and they go, Nebuchadnezzar, these Jews, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. You know, it kind of makes you wonder in a way, if these guys were bowing down to the statue of Nebuchadnezzar when the music was playing, how did they see these other three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not bowing down? And isn't it funny that it's oftentimes the most critical people that are also the most hypocritical people when it comes to Christianity. I remember there's this guy that uh, was a part of a, quote, Christian camp that I, I grew up going to that was sponsored by my denominational church. And sadly, when I became a disciple, uh, he strongly uh, persecuted me and my, my brother. is very critical of us, uh, even called us uh, a cult and, and various things like that. And then uh, as time went on, uh, you know, I've studied the Bible with many, many different guys. I, I studied the Bible with a guy who happened to go to the same Christian camp that I went to. And sadly, this guy confessed to me that he had the same counselor, and this camp counselor molested him as a little boy. I, I mean, here's this guy, he is being critical of us, and at the same time, he's molesting little boys. And, and isn't that what so much of today's religious world is? Complete and total hypocrites? In fact, it's been said that the largest cause of atheism today is the hypocrisy of those that call themselves Christians. You see, as disciples, we're, we're not hypocrites. We say what we mean, and we mean what we say. We live by the Word of God. And where we fall short, we're open, we're humble, and we get real about where we stand before God. You with me right here? Let's keep reading right here in verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? I'm like, wow, if there's a scripture that really kind of shows the arrogance of Nebuchadnezzar, it's this scripture right here. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was ticked off. He gets Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he goes, Is it true? Is it true that you're really not going to worship this 90-foot statue of myself? Is it true that you do not want to serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have set up? But, you know, it's interesting to see how many times in the scripture even, Nebuchadnezzar uses the words, my, I, or me. In verse 14, he goes, my gods. In verse 14, again, he says, the image of gold I have set up. In verse 15, he says, the image I made. And then to cap it all off, in verse 15, he goes, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? You know, that's ultimately why people choose to follow their own plan rather than God's plan. Why they choose not to obey God. It's not that they don't love God at all. But the problem and the reason why oftentimes people don't follow God is because they really just love themselves more than they love God. And when they see the scriptures and the scriptures call them to deny self 
in to choose God over self that they can't do it because they love themselves more than God. And that was where Nebuchadnezzar was at. He made a statue of himself. He was obsessed with himself. And some of us even today are so obsessed with ourselves that we refuse to follow the scriptures, the word of God, because we just want to build up our own life. Let's keep reading verse 19. I mean, this is going to be the most epic response you've ever seen. Verse 16. Verse 16 right here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, then God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I mean, is this not the most cranking response right here to King Nebuchadnezzar's arrogance? They just simply go, hey, King Neb, I mean, so much, so much to learn, so, so little time. You know, we, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. I mean, we're not trying to be defensive here. Look, if God wants us to be safe from the fire, then, you know, I guess he'll probably just make that happen. But, but even if he doesn't, well, we want you to know, King Neb, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I mean, the faith that these guys had, the guts, the boldness. They, they, we're not really bothered by the fact that you're threatening us with the blazing furnace. We believe that God will save us if he wants to. But even if he does not, we will stay true to our God. Let's see what happens. Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times harder than usual. And commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing only robes, trousers, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown in the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fires killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives, rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language should say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut to pieces, and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I mean, these guys had a fiery faith. They weren't afraid of the fire. They weren't afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. They believed that God could and would save them. And even if he didn't, they were going to do what was right because they knew that God had something far better in store for them. You know, I believe as a church, we've got to have a fiery faith and not play it safe as Christians. We've got to have the faith of Shadrach. We've got to have the faith of Meshach. We've got to have the faith of Abednego. And today, I want to give you four fiery faith challenges as a church. My first fiery faith challenge. I want to challenge you in your faith to share your faith with someone that intimidates you or in a setting that scares you. I want to challenge you to share your faith with someone that intimidates you or in a setting that terrifies you or scares you. You know, I'll never forget when I was in college. Uh, back in uh, 2003, 2004, I was majoring in communication and minoring in uh, business administration. And as I was there in college, one of the classes that I was forced to take was leadership and communication. And a part of the classes, we'd have these, these group discussions, 
And uh, people would be sharing their various opinions and then we'd comment on them and, and have these talks. And I'll never forget, there's this one day in our, our leadership and communication class where, where someone brought up the topic of homosexuality in class. Now, this was a very liberal college. And so, you know, this comes up and, and my professor responds to her, her comment on homosexuality by saying, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't know why Christians are so against homosexuality. Uh, even David and Jonathan in the Bible had a homosexual relationship. I heard that and I, I was furious. I was ticked off. I mean, absolutely, David and Jonathan were friends, but the Bible in no way ever says anything about them having a homosexual relationship. On top of that, I don't believe that Christians need to be upset about homosexuals or against homosexuals. Yes, homosexuality is against the Bible and wrong, but it's no more wrong than any other sin. And we need to love the sinner and hate the sin. You with me right here, church? That said, I was so upset. I was sitting there in this class, and here this guy is misrepresenting the Bible to the very class that I'm trying to reach out to and bring to church and to save. And so I'm sitting there, and I, I was angry, and so I didn't want to respond at first, but I thought about it. I go, you know what? I'm going to go home, and I'm going to write this guy an email. And so I get home, and I, I immediately go to the computer, and I just start typing up this email, and I start going through uh, various scriptures in the Bible to show him that theologically speaking, uh, the terminology that the Bible uses about David and Jonathan's relationship in no way conveys homosexuality, that they were close, they were, they were great brothers to each other, but they were not homosexual or in a homosexual relationship. And so I've got this three-page long email, and I'm, I'm just ready. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty bold in my letter. But then it gets to the end of the email, and I'm, I'm getting ready to send it. And then all of a sudden, my anger turns to fear. <laughs> I, just, I mean, here I am. I just wrote this bold letter to my college professor, whom I know has the power to fail or pass me in the course. And I did not want to take that course over again. I wanted to graduate. So I'm looking at this three-page long letter, and I'm like, oh, should I send it? Should I not? Should I cower, or should I have faith? And I go, I just need to have faith. And so I, I push send, and, and there I was just kind of waiting for a little while and, and thinking maybe he's going to respond. So I kept checking my email, and then uh, after a little while, I go, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to wait until he responds back. Well, that same night, he sends me an email back, and he goes, uh, to my surprise, he says, uh, Evan, I can see that you're much more versed on this topic than I am. I I'm so sorry that I misrepresented the Bible to the class. How do you think I should proceed? Now, here I am, and I'm in this leadership and communication class, and I think that I'm learning exactly what God wants me to learn. I'm going, wow, I I'm now telling the professor what I want the professor to do in his own class. I go, this is great. So I go, hey, I think you should apologize to the class. I was like, I'm going to be bold. I think you should apologize to the class. And I think you should give me an opportunity to address the class. He goes, okay, I will do that. I'm like blown away. Well, the next day he apologizes to the entire class about misrepresenting the Bible. And then he gives me an opportunity to speak. And I got a chance to share my faith with the entire uh, college class. Amen. Now, sadly, there were others that were there that were professed Christians that came up to me after and said, hey, you know, we totally agree with you. And I'm so glad that you said something. You know, I thought that we should say something, but we decided not to. You know, so many people know that they should step up. Know that they should share with this, different people. Have you ever been prompted by the Holy Spirit to share with someone? And then you, you cower out? So many people are afraid and they give in to their fear. We need to have a fiery faith that overcomes the fear. And share our faith with those that scare us. Those that intimidate us. Or in settings that terrify us. My second fiery faith challenge for you. I want to challenge you as a disciple, as a group of disciples, to get a dream to go into ICCM or to get a dream for the full-time ministry. You know, this, this last week, we were able to go to Campus Devotional uh, with Campus Ministry, and we've got a great group of, of young campus students. And uh, we're having a great group discussion about, you know, things that scare us and, and just a fun discussion. And then I, I decided to ask the question, where would you like to see yourself in six months from now? And one by one, everybody went around and shared. And, and the one that really stuck out was Divine Sharon. She's only been a disciple for a little over a year. And she goes, for sure, in six months, I want to be in ICCM. Now, I was fired up. But, but, but sadly, there's a little bit of, of you could tell, 
uh, of laughter or even scoffing in the room because they know that she's in college and that would be very difficult to do college and ICCM. And, and they're going, oh boy, what are you trying to get yourself into? But, but I think that that's the heart that God wants us to have, to dream to do more for him. To dream to get deeper in our knowledge of the scriptures. And to even dream and dare to go into the full-time ministry. You know, that said, not everyone is blessed with the ability or the opportunity for full-time ministry. But I think that, that one of the reasons why we don't choose the full-time ministry, when we are given the opportunity or we do have the ability for the full-time ministry, is because we choose the American dream over God's dream for our life. We want to have the house, we want to have the, the comfortable life, rather than putting our lives in God's hands, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did right here, trusting that God would take care of us. You know, I'll never forget sitting down with uh, Isaiah Famarewa, and the uh, first conversation we ever had, asking him about his life, asking him about how it's been as a disciple, and then at the end of the conversation, I go, man, this guy's very gifted. I go, have you ever thought about the full-time ministry? Then I'll never forget his response. He laughed at me. And he goes, bro, 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 I don't want to be poor. You know, and sadly for many people, that's their heart when it comes to the full-time ministry. They don't want it because they want to do what they want to do. The American dream versus God's dream. And now it's exciting because uh, since last November, Isaiah is in the full-time ministry. And yes, he's poor, but he's fired up about it. Amen. We've got to have a dream to go into the full-time ministry, or at the very least, get into ICCM and deepen our relationship with God through the scriptures. Our third fiery faith challenge. I want to challenge you, if you're a young Christian, to memorize the first principles Bible studies and lead someone to baptize or to baptism this year. To, to memorize the entire first principles Bible study series and to lead someone to baptism this year. You know, well, I've shared my faith and it's not been working. I've tried to, to, to study the Bible with people and I didn't do a very good job. Well, I think that sharing our faith and studying the Bible with people and baptizing people is kind of like when you lose your keys at home. You know how it is? You get frustrated because you're looking at every nook and cranny and every crack and crevice of your house trying to find your keys and, and you go to one place and you don't get it and then you start to get frustrated and angry and upset and go, God, please give me my keys. And you go to the next place, you don't find them there. You go to the next place, but then you finally find your keys. And there's no greater feeling when you've lost your keys than when you finally find your keys. And that's kind of how it is when we're studying the Bible with people. You find one person and they're not open, they walk away. You find another person to do a few Bible studies and they walk away. You find another person to get all the way to the end and they walk away and then you start getting frustrated. You go, God, when am I going to ever baptize somebody? But then you find the guy with the golden heart, the girl with the golden heart that just wants to be a disciple no matter what the cost. And that feeling you get when you see them go into the waters of baptism is like that feeling when you find your keys or your wallet after it's been lost for a long time. Even the Bible says that in Luke 15. It's like uh, finding a lost coin when one sinner repents. And the Bible says that there is a party in heaven when that happens. You with me right here, church? We've got to have a heart to be able to be effective with the Word of God, to study the Bible with people, and to help people to come to the waters of baptism and give their life to the Lord. Our fourth fiery challenge is I want to challenge you to be more, quote, fired up than you've ever been before. You know, here Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were being thrown into a blazing furnace. It was heated up seven times hotter than it should have been heated to. It was so hot that the people that were putting them into the furnace died because of the heat of the flames. And yet they were completely comfortable going into the furnace. They, they weren't uncomfortable. They weren't freaking out. They, they weren't terrified. Why? Because Jesus was in there with them. Yes, your life may be challenging as a Christian. Maybe, maybe you're experiencing some, some things right now that, that are hard to go through. Yes, being a Christian is just tough in general. But as long as Jesus is with you in the fire, you should be so fired up. In this morning, you need to make a choice. Are you going to play it safe as a Christian? Or are you going to have a fiery faith? You see, God gave Nebuchadnezzar a vision. A vision of a mountain. A kingdom that would fill the entire earth. 
And like Nebuchadnezzar's vision, we are that humble rock that, 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 that struck the statue. Small at first, unassuming at first, tiny, dinky, just a little band of brothers and sisters together in Toronto, 45 strong. But through our fiery faith, we believe that like that mountain, we will fill our city, we will fill our province, we will fill our country, and we'll eventually fill the entire earth in our generation. How? How are we going to do it? We're going to do it because we believe that Jesus is in the fire with us and because no other God can save in this way. Thank you. I love you. God bless you all.